I'm happy and grateful this morning. Grateful to the Lord who has brought me safely across the ocean. <laughs> I'm happy to be with you and to have a chance to get to know you a little. And I have also a special motive for satisfaction. I can preach this morning a message which has been on my mind, in my heart, for quite a time, which I could not preach in church on an ordinary Sunday service. It would not be adapted <coughs> to many of our brothers and sisters. It would burden some of them with unnecessary problems. It requires some background knowledge and some sharpened interests, which I trust you possess. <laughs> Jesus, in the passages we just heard, uses universal symbols to draw people to himself. Food and drink, essential elements on which life depends, and so the Lord Jesus awakens in every hearer who does not close himself to his voice, the sense of the deeper hunger and thirst, which is deep in everyone who is made in God's image and has a destiny of fellowship with his creator. Jesus awakens through those basic symbols, but he also loads them with a wealth of content. He speaks to people who know some, uh, at least much of the scriptures, and uh, as he speaks of water to the Samaritan woman, he implicitly, or almost explicitly, presents what he brings as the antitype of the water of the well, the water that the patriarch Jacob had made available uh, for uh, his family and, and his uh, livestock, Jesus begins to appear as greater than our father Jacob at the Samaritan woman quite finally understands. <laughs> and when he answers the Jews who speak of the sign of the manna, bread from heaven, he also shows that he brings the true bread of heaven, that he is the true bread of heaven, come down from heaven, that gives eternal life, and so that he is greater than Moses himself. Moses, our doctor, Moreno, the Jews still state, say today, Moses was not able to break the rule of death. They ate of that bread and they died. But Jesus is bringing the death, the victory over death, uh, death defeating bread of heaven, he is himself. And he also speaks in, in John 6, this is very obvious I would say, as wisdom. Wisdom comes in person. He suddenly so interpreted his own identity. We have two parallel verses in Luke and Matthew which definitely prove that Jesus presented himself as wisdom. We have the same word, it's the same logion. Jesus says that he will be sending prophets and other messengers, he says, uh, sages and, and uh, scribes in the Gospel of Matthew, I will be sending. And then in Luke 11, you find the same word, practically, but then the wisdom of God has said, I will send you prophets, and so on, and they will kill them. So uh, you see Jesus very clearly stated that he was the wisdom of God. And we can uh, discern that in his own strategy, he patterned 
his way of doing things after the model of wisdom in Proverbs. On several points, we can see a correspondence. Jesus was wisdom in person, and in John 6, we can see the very strong presence of Proverbs 9, the banquet of wisdom. In Proverbs 9, wisdom personified invites to her banquet all those who will admit their need of her. And the food she presents, well, obviously, it is the content of wisdom, what wisdom teaches, therefore, wisdom itself. Wisdom offer at the courses of her dinner, we could say the courses with the students are to follow. <laughs> Jesus takes up this beautiful image from Proverbs 9, and he invites all those who will come to his banquet, where he is the food, he, the wisdom, come, come in person. This, I think, is a clear correspondence again. As you know, during the intertestamental period, the wisdom tradition blossomed in Israel. And there was one book, very popular in Judaism, the book of Jesus, son of Sirach, called Ecclesiasticus in Tradition, where wisdom personified on the basis of Proverbs, Proverbs 9, presents herself in similar ways. And I would like to read a few verses from chapter 24 of this apocryphal book, Ecclesiasticus. You now understand why I said I couldn't preach it in church. See? Ecclesiastical 24, wisdom is speaking, verse 9, before the age, before from the beginning he created me, the Lord, and until the age I will never fail. And then in starting verse 17, I like a vine budded forth favor, and my blossoms were the fruit of glory and wealth. Come to me, you who desire me, and from my produce be filled. For the memory of me is sweet beyond honey, and the inheritance of me beyond the honeycomb of honey. Those who eat me will hunger for more. And we could also translate, shall still be hungry. And those who drink me will thirst for more, shall still be thirsty. He who obeys me will not be ashamed, and those who work with me will not sin. You can spot the correspondences. Uh, the declaration about pre-existence, the image of the vine, the affirmation that the one who put his trust or her trust in him will, will not, or in her in wisdom, will not be put to shame. And then, especially, verse 21 of Ecclesiasticus 24, which corresponds to what we, we heard in John 4 and John 6, a relationship between eating and drinking uh, of what is offered and further thirst, and further hunger. But then what is striking here, almost shocking, <laughs> is that wisdom in Ecclesiasticus cell says that those who eat me shall, no long, shall uh, still be thirsty, uh, uh, hungry, and those who drink me shall still be uh, thirsty. And Jesus negates in his word precisely those words. He, he says, shall never be hungry, never be thirsty. This is an opportunity for us to say a word about the relationship uh, of Jesus to the Apocrypha. <laughs> I think this may, may be uh, helpful for us. I, I will not enlarge on this, but still, it is of some interest. Protestants, evangelicals, have often felt what the great Hebrew scholar of the 17th century, John Lightfoot, said, the wretched Apocrypha. <laughs> 
we see here that Jesus had read the Apocrypha and meditated upon what they were saying. And the Apocrypha are useful indeed for knowledge of the context. And in some cases, knowledge of what they say illuminates what uh, the, the meaning of the verses in the gospel. At the same time, Jesus never quoted them as scripture. And if there are here reminiscences quite obvious from Ecclesiasticus, they are not introduced as scripture at all. And even Jesus reverses what the wisdom in Ecclesiastical uh, says. Could he do that with a canonical text? Maybe he could. We have to grant that. Because we know that there are uh, con apparent contradictions among canonical passages that have to be solved by a sound exegesis. <laughs> so uh, maybe we could accept the idea. However, I still doubt that Jesus would have re uh, reversed the very wording in so direct a fashion if it had been uh, part of the word of God. I still doubt it. Some people say that he, he does so in the Sermon on the Mount with the word on hatred for enemies. But as you know, the safer interpretation of uh, this passage in the Sermon on the Mount is that Jesus refers only to the tradition in Judaism, not to the sacred text itself, and maybe especially to uh, a passage in Ecclesiasticus. Ecclesiasticus 12 has a lot by way of hatred of enemies. <laughs> so uh, I think this is an interesting illustration of the relationship of our Lord to these uh, important texts of Jewish piety, yet not part of inspired scripture. We are to recognize, I think, that Ecclesiasticus is true in one sense, even in the verse uh, I'm referring to. There is truth in what uh, the wisdom of Ecclesiasticus says. We should go on desiring the presence of him who is wisdom. We should still have such a hunger and thirst that we never get satiated. <laughs> we never say, oh, I had enough of it. This, I think, is a legitimate insight in the verse from Ecclesiasticus. I would even be so bold as to suggest that it will still be true in the final state, in the pure blessedness of heaven. My argument is based on the fact that in 1 Corinthians 13, hope and faith are lasting realities. When comes the end, they belong to the three that last, just as love does in that passage. I know, of course, that in other passages, in Romans 8 in particular, Paul draws a contrast between hope and sight. But I think we can reconcile the two by saying that the whole regime uh, of faith and hope will be changed in sight. But still, there is something essential in faith and hope that will continue. It will not just be fixity. It will be a continuous growth in the knowledge and enjoyment of the divine presence. Our Lord, I may say a word tonight about this category, but I think we may say has infinite riches of wisdom and mercy and love. And eternity will not be too long for us to receive a greater uh, understanding and, and experience of, of this. So this may still be true in life eternal in full unfolding. Yet, I suggest that preference for the version of Ecclesiasticus, still thirst and, and, and hunger, is highly suspect. If I am not mistaken, most among our contemporaries would be much more attracted by what 
wisdom in the in ecclesiastical sense than with Jesus' words. Our contemporaries are modern, late modern, with all the traits of modernity still more obvious. But modernity in general have preferred hunting to catching. This is what Blaise Pascal in the 17th century already said. We prefer hunting to catching. And regarding religious and theological pursuits, there is a very famous passage from Lessing, which I think is worth reading also. Lessing, not whole Lessing, in the, seven, in the 18th century, had published one of the first vicious writings of biblical, negative biblical criticism against the truth of the Gospels by a scholar named Raymarus, but uh, Lessing had published it. Uh, and uh, the Orthodox tried to respond, and he was attacked by the Orthodox. And so he wrote a duplic, uh, an answer uh, to the Orthodox critique uh, of his publishing the, the text. And in this passage, what, what does he say? If God held all truth concealed in his right hand and in his left hand the persistent striving for the truth while warning me against eternal error and should say, choose, I should humbly bow before his left hand and say, Father, give thy gift. The pure truth is for thee alone. This is preferring the search of truth, even if it uh, reaches only error, to the truth itself. Definitely said, and this is a passage which receives praise in our culture. Uh, oh, this is admired. Uh, this is also a, a, a social trait. Uh, those who are champions of hunting uh, get all, all the honor. Uh, they are brilliant, they, they are uh, admired. I think this is deeply perverse. It shows actually that truth is not the true interest <laughs> of these so-called searchers. They are considering their own states of mind, their own achievement, the brilliancy uh, of the way they put it, uh, their creativity. See? This is what is praised, not truth itself. What would anyone say of a lover who would say what really uh, is precious to me is approaching <laughs> my beloved one? <laughs> being with, with him or her, no, <laughs> that's, not so, that's not so interesting to me. This would not be love. We, we, we all agree. Uh, there is no love of the truth in that complacency for self, uh, in that uh, idolatry uh, of the, the ways of man uh, in his search. And this applies to our theological work. This has a message for us. This temptation to prize the way we, we express what we are doing, the brilliancy of, of its presentation, originality, find something new to say. This is the great value in today's academic microcosm. Uh, we, we must remember it. Uh, if we are not motivated by the love of truth, the love of him who is the truth, then there may be a spirit, a spirit of error spread. Second Thessalonians 2, remember the judgment of those who have not had the love of truth. And this is valid for our theological work. 
But this warning heard, then what does Jesus mean? Probably in his time, this appetite uh, for hunting was less pronounced, although, although we may have established a link with legalism. I think we could interpret legalism in this way too. But what did Jesus basically mean when he reversed the words of the wisdom in Ecclesiasticus? I think the context is quite clear. Jesus stresses that all the things that have been offered up to his coming are things that satisfy for a time. But he is bringing eternal life. That's the phrase that comes and comes and comes again in the passages we have read. Eternal life. He is greater than Jacob, greater than Moses. He is wisdom in person and not only wisdom personified. And what he brings is so much more than all the communications of wisdom that uh, had been uh, granted before him. And so he now is the final mediator, the one in whom all the fullness of deity is present and in whom we are filled perfectly, entirely, so that there is no more hunger and painful thirst. And again, this, this has relevance to our theological work. I'm speaking to theological students, so I emphasize this point. The final Christ against all the temptations of relativism, of the idea that while there are all other cultures, this is uh, the final mediator for us, but not the final mediator. You know how popular this idea can be around us. We know also how the appetite for, for novelty is a way of saying, well, this is not the final word. 2,000 years ago, this cannot be the final thing. You see the temptation? against which we must be on our guards. Jesus is the final mediator. He is wisdom in person, and he gives himself to us as the final food, the final drink, the water, the living water. And you note, this implies that it is not just static, that it is ever-growing. This water he gives becomes a fountain swelling up in our own being forever and forever for all time and for eternity we love we love the final Christ